Hello and welcome sailors and guests to the Commodore's Dinner of the 2014 International 110 National Regatta. As you know, this is the 75th anniversary of the International 110, which first sailed out of Marblehead in 1939. We are here again at the Eastern Yacht Club in Marblehead and are honored to have our speaker tonight, Jim Hunt, the son of C. Raymond Hunt, the designer of the International 110. Yeah. Before we start, I just wanted to say that uh, I spent a lot of time with my father from the very tender age of five. He went lobstering out of Cohasset and um, did very well with it, and we had hundreds of dollars. I've never seen anything like it. That was a long time ago. And he did it for about eight months, and then after that, <clears throat> I crewed with him basically from the age of 13 up until after the, well, no, after the Olympics, and then we were in the World Championship, and we won. I wanted to show you this model. Does anybody know what it is? 10-10. How did you know that? Somebody <laughs> told me. Oh! I had this model in my basement for 30 years. It was all covered with white paint. Wow. And a year ago, I said, well, what I should do is finish it and show it to some people. Well, I thought it was a 110. Mm -hmm. and had I really looked at it, you think anybody that spent 27 years in the boat business would know better. You know, it has rocker in the bottom and all. And the 1010 was a design that Briggs Cunningham, you may remember him from racing as well as cars, commissioned Raymond to... Uh, wow design of, he wanted, he owned a 225. And he came to Raymond, he said, I want you to design me a boat that looks like a 110, that's long, and will beat a 12 meter. So this is the actual tank test model that was done down in Hoboken, New Jersey, down in Stevens. And the tank came back and said that it didn't have enough lateral plane. In other words, the keel wasn't big enough. Raymond didn't believe it. But that sort of squashed the project, which was too bad. A 55-foot 110 would be a pretty cool boat. Oh, man. I mean, talk about being fast. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. It would have been a rocket ship. Mm -hmm. But they came back later and said they had made a mistake. And the mistake that they had made was they didn't take into consideration the chime. And it's like a 110. When you heel it over, it develops a, a lot of lateral resistance. And all they had to do was to tank the, the model at about, say, this degree, and the boat was fine. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. Raymond was born in 1908 in Somerville, Massachusetts. And um, he was in a very much of a boating family, not necessarily racing. But his father and grandfather were very influential. This is the original Duxbury Yacht Club. He had some land in Duxbury, and they built this. And it was it was the uh, club from 1890 to 19 something. And I think it got washed away in a hurricane. Next one is a picture of C. Raymond at the age of five. <laughs> he built a model boat of his father's 18-footer. Um, now look at this group. This is 1923 when they won the Sears Cup the first time. Now look at the dress. I mean, that, that was the official uniform. Next. This, Raymond was also an incredible athlete. He, went, he only had one year of advanced education at Andover. Just one year. His freshman year, he was first line hockey. He was asked to join the Olympic um, hockey team, but he declined it because he was wanting to do other stuff, and, which is unfortunate. I will never forget when I was co-captain of our prep school hockey team, 
one day he came down. And we were, you know, we weren't great, but we were okay. He came down and he could skate right through it. Just unbelievable. And the only way we could get him was to gang up on him. Wow. And he was 47 years old. By the way. And we were just a bunch of, you know, <laughs> rabble rousers. I think he's the second one in on the bottom row from the left. I think. Now this is two years after they won the first Sears Cup. He was runner-up in 1924. So they won it in 23, runner-up in 24, and this is 1925. Look at the dress code change. <laughs> This is the uh, eight meter gypsy. Some of you, that, well, maybe none of you are old enough. <laughs> <laughs> the hell with you. <laughs> <laughs> gypsy was a Frank Payne design, and my father was very, um, very attached with Frank Payne. He was a designer, and I actually did a lot of work with him. And he sailed this boat, he took it down to Suwanaka. And they won six straight races. The committee, and they only sailed with three people. The committee was so PO'd, or they just couldn't understand how this puny 18-year-old kid, or maybe he was 21, he was 21 years old at the time, would be allowed to do that. So they forced him to take two more crew members on the last race he won that too. <laughs> this is his R boat. Um, which he sailed a lot. Again, this is all in Marble Head. And he had many, many wins in it. The next one is when his father died, <clears throat> very unexpectedly, he uh, decided to hell with it. He left in November, <clears throat> excuse me, and single-handed the boat down the boat with North Carolina. And he ended up in the brick. And he, but he got off, and, but he ended up with a, in the hospital with pneumonia. And the story that's told is that he had a romantic affair with a nurse, and I can believe it. <laughs> and this is my mother and father when they were married in 1932. My mother was a, she lived in Cohasset, she was a dean, and that was the beginning. And this is just a newspaper article, which has got, it's a little bit unique. My mother's in the bottom left photo, and they would race on the Charles River. This was in 1933, one year after they were married. And they'd win everything. And this is when he first got involved with Waldo Howland, who, as you know, started Concordia Company and was responsible for 100 and something Concordias. They built, they built a bunch of these together. This is the J-Boat Yankee, designed by Frank Payne. My father was in the afterguard at the tender age of, I think the first time he was in the afterguard, he was 18 years old. And he was in the afterguard in 1930, 34, 37. They lost to Rainbow in 1937 by one second. And they had the spinnakers which were enormous. You know, these were enormous boats. They were, the masts were 134 feet off the water. And my father went up it when they were going through the canal because the clearance was 135 feet. And by the time he got to the top, he realized that the main guy weighed more than he did. He had to hold on to prevent himself to go through the top ship. <laughs> but one thing that they had, all the spinnakers were made of silk. And they cost them twenty thousand dollars then. Now that today I don't know what it would be, but it would be a lot. obviously a lot of bread. And they were sailing one day, and father was right alongside the helm, and he knew it was going to explode. But you know, the owner said, "Oh, the hell with it. What difference does it make?" So they did, and all of a sudden it exploded. And when a silk parachute explodes, it turns into a million little tiny pieces. Well, he tried to say this, but didn't. This is his Q-boat Hornet, 
1934, 35, 36, he won the Manhasset Bay Challenge Company, brought it back to Marblehead. In 
It was way ahead of its time except for one thing. The old man knew that in order to make multi hulls fast, you had to build them light. And one day off here, one hull went to the left and the other hull went to the right. <laughs> and by the time they reinforced it, it was too heavy and then it didn't sail very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, build, I built a 45-foot cat and you have to build them light. And this is a uh, drawing of a destroyer. We used to have the tank model of this. It was about six feet long, but it got stolen. It was 340 feet long, but it was 20% wider than a conventional destroyer in a totally different underbody. It was tank tested to 50 knots. Charles Francis Adams was then the Secretary of the Navy and tried to push it through, but it was 1943 and the war was winding down. And you know, trying to buck the Bureau of Ships and the government is that's sort of like climbing a slippery post. But, you know, it destroyed it. This is Zara, but we had it, uh, Gordon Monroe boat that he bought. It was built in 1939. We bought it in 1950, I think. We lived on it in Marblehead at the head of the harbor for two seasons without a rig in it. <laughs> and one of Raymond's escapades was to we were members of this club. And we would take the cabbie or the launch, and Raymond would sit on the swim ladder with a pair of skis on, roll his pants up, put his shoes around his head, and he always wore a sport jacket and a tie. And we skied him into the club float right here. And you know, ripping through the harbor then, it wasn't even an issue. And he would just plunk himself down in the dark. It was kind of cool. With this boat, we also won two New London to Marblehead races. So it was, you know, it was a reasonable boat, but it was a very conventional type boat. I think it just proves his total expertise in racing. This is the little cabbie I was talking about, and I was driving it at the tender age of 14. Uh, not many people realize that my father and Ted Hood were in partnership building sails and they developed actually the spherical spinnaker together and also worked on the original synthetic fabric orlon because I can remember coating it in Ted Hood's backyard here on the point. This is Seablitz halfway between the original hunt forms and the bee hulls. This is owned by was built by Brad Noyes, who lived right next door. And uh, it had a 1,500 horse V12 Packard aircraft engine in it. And it would do 60 miles an hour and it held the world record for a week, I think, what Brad said. And it would only burn 100 gallons an hour. <laughs> 130 octane fuel. It was aviation fuel. <laughs> Ted Hood and Brad and a couple of others decided they'd take it down to watch the uh, New London Yale races with uh, against Harvard. So they ripped down there and the Coast Guard comes running after them because they're going so fast they're not supposed to. So what did they do? They go down below. They'd just gotten out of the Navy and they put on their uniforms went to the rail and stood at attention and the coast guard was so befuddled they said oh my word this is really cool so that was the end of it next picture is a picture in bermuda that's ted hood on the left my father in the middle and brad noise on the right this was when they won the prince of wales trophy Quixotic, 1956, Ted Hood was designed by my father. It's a 5.5 meter that was designed for heavy air because the finals were in Melbourne, Australia, Perth, I think it was. And Don McNamara was part of the crew. And I remember watching the trials in Marion. They had the series in the bag, as we all say. But in race number seven, they got disqualified and in race number eight, which was the last one, all they had to do was beat one boat and the Hazard Chapel let go. Uh. Um, next is a picture of my mother and father in the Isle of Wight cows. 
and um, when they were launching Zombie, which is a whale type hull, we raced Grumby to Bermuda, and um, the whole family joined up, and that's my younger sister, myself, my father, mother, and brother Josh, and sister Diana or Jan, as she refers to. 58 Easterner. Probably the second biggest disappointment for Sea Raymond, no question. It was Owen Stevens felt that it was the best design. But Fenwick Williams did all the scantling work, and my father really didn't pay that much attention to it. And after the original trials, I sailed on it in 58 and 62, we stripped the boat and started taking out. They used butt blocks, and I think we took out 500 butt blocks, which are big squares of mahogany. And I think we took at least 1,500 pounds out of the boat, and if I remember correctly, 1,000 pounds is an inch of immersion. Had the boat been built correctly and sailed correctly, it was sailed by a family that were, they were wonderful people, but they certainly weren't world-class sailors. And my father wouldn't touch the helm. He would run the starts. He'd tell them exactly what to do with the starts. If you remember the old starts, they don't do it anymore today with the catamaran. But you just go around in circles, chasing each other. That's the only picture I've ever seen of Raymond actually sailing the boat. Next is a whole Shola series that he did, 28 to 38 feet. And it's interesting. I took these hull lines because I went to, when Ted Hood put his book out, I went, to the, I went to the book signing at the Boston Yacht Club here in Marblehead, and when I took it home, I compared the hull lines to this, and Hood called it the Delta Form Hull, 1972, that was 34 years later, and the lines are identical. Mm. <laughs> Next slide is a trip we took, and I don't know, there are two trips we took as a family that I remember and everybody remembered just wonderfully. We took off for seven months, sailed the boat down to the Bahamas, and we spent four months in the Bahamas cruising around. It was just a great, great trip. And if you ever have the opportunity with your kids, do it. Next is just a picture we took at Christmas. And this is, <laughs> we sailed over to Fresh Creek on Andros, and at that point, the locals were, they had put out a story that there were red-eyed men on Fresh Creek. And it turned out 20 years later, the reason they did it was to keep yachties out of the place. So it wasn't true, but anyway, we, my brother, younger brother and younger sister, our ages were 11 to 15, sailed up the river, and we spent two days out in the wild being a little outrageous. And as I said, we, we got to know the natives. The first time we'd ever been around natives in our whole lives, and we became very, very close. We were the only non-native people in Rock Sound, except for the minister, and here's Raymond cleaning fish with some of the locals behind our house. And some of the boys, the boys will be boys. And there's me with a bunch of the friends. And we were there for four months, as I said. When we left in April, there were tears. And it, was, it was really quite an experience. Uh, another picture of Zara. Uh, the reason this is in there is that when we left the Bahamas in April, my mother had studied celestial navigation through Mixture, if I remember correctly taking sights on land and blah, 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 We get out to sea, and she she just couldn't, she and Bill White, who was in the in the uh, Navy and should have known better, they just couldn't make it work. So I don't know if you've ever taken sights. I did a couple of Bermuda races taking sights, and it's, you really have to practice it because of the way the boat's moving and all. But anyway, the point of the story is that we, 
We left the Bahamas. Brad Noyes was on board, my mother, myself, and my father. And we tacked, we got into a storm, and we tacked for three days. It's about a 1,000 miles to Bermuda. And I think we were eight days or nine days or something. And we, uh, we hit Bermuda right on the nose. I mean, I've done 17 Bermuda races, and I can tell you, hitting Bermuda can be a challenge. We left Bermuda, and we again dead reckon all the way to no man's land. And Bill White wrote an article that was a five-page article that went into Yachting Magazine about the feet. Our, our era for 1,600, 1,700 miles was less than one degree. And the old man would go down below probably for an hour and a half a day. And the one instrument we had, we had an RDF, but it broke. The one instrument we had was a Walker tap reel log that we would record the miles and be very careful about that. And he got us all the way here. The guy was amazing. And the only chart we had, it was 1 to 3.5 million scale. <laughs> it ran from Nova Scotia to South America. That's the God's honest truth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is just a picture of Maley, which was the smallest boat ever to win the Bermuda race. She's at Concordia. I sailed back with Dan Stromae, and he was, he, talk about a man who loved the boat. He was just wild. On this one, this is where we picked up, Harrier was a Concordia 41, we picked it up at the Yard, Abbe King and Rasmussen in Lindea to Germany and sailed it down, I think it's the Elbe, and over to Cows. Again, as a family. Six of us lived on the boat for four months. And this boat, this is a picture taken in the Solon. The boat then had a very wide rig with a boom pin and a bowsprit. We won every race. <laughs> And the British, they almost drove my father crazy. They would come in and they would say, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> and he would just cower. But every race, I think that we, they were 50 pounds, you won money. And the pound then was worth about $5, so that's like $250 a race. And that's back when, you know, $250, that was a lot of money. So the old man went to the committee and said, look, I can't take this money. It might hurt my amateur standing. Because back then it was a serious thing. And so they made up this placard and gave us a clock and barometer. We then went in the fastest race. Uh, Karina that won it was two hours ahead of us at Fasted Rock, which is two thirds of the race done. She had to give us, I think it was 12 hours. And the leg back to England was it was all downhill. We would have won the thing by, I don't know, six hours. Well, we all say that. But we broke two turnbuckles. So we had to abandon the race. We sailed into Kinsale, Ireland, and bought some turnbuckles off a trawler. So that would have been a perfect summer. You know, we won six for six. And then if we'd won the fasted race, which was certainly the preeminent race and still is today, it would have been pretty cool. And the stuff in the cows was all done by the family. The fast and race wasn't. We're getting close. Uh, this is Harrier Dismantle. We sailed it up to Gothenburg, Sweden. We got on the Kunz home, CRH flew home, and we put Harrier on the freighter. And this was, he came out and escorted us, or we escorted him or something. And here's Raymond again. I mean, talk about a man who would caught on a limb. That's Harriet to the left with a catboat rig. Oh, we had won the Annapolis-Newport race the year before. And Raymond decided that he could beat the rule by doing a catboat. <laughs> so he got a very favorable rating. And I'll never forget it. We were like 100 miles from the finish. It's about a 500-mile race, if I remember right. And the wind shifted and came on the nose, and we we didn't do very well. And thank God we didn't. I mean, that would have set 
I think it would have set voting back a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> and with Harrier, we went on the New York cruise. I'll never forget it. That was, again, the top racing. And we won, we got five first out of six races. Next one is Moffy, you've probably heard about. This was the first oh, yeah. D-Hull with Sam Griffith and Jim Wynn and Carlton Mitchell was the navigator. And they, and it just, they won that race by over four hours and talk about a brutal ride. Yeah, right. Anyway, that was the beginning of the D-Hull. And then not to be outdone, Raymond decided that he had a friend, Bill Whipple, who was an offshore lobsterman, and he convinced Bill that what he should do is cut the back end of his boat off. And uh, this was the first time it ever been done. Paul Loring did a cartoon article, and there's a picture on the next slide. So that is the original lobster boat a long time ago with the uh, cut-off transom. <coughs> This, this is yonder, the boat I talked about, the 47-footer that started with the surface propeller. The CIA came to Raymond through Grumman aircraft. <laughs> this, was at the, this was 1960, it was the height of the Cuban crisis. And they wanted him to test pulling trailers, which were fuel cells. So my brother, and they put, I don't know how many, 55-gallon drums in each one of those and they went out and towed it with the crudest towing thing I've ever seen in my life. And they proved that below 15 knots, those trailers actually pushed the boat forward. So there was no drag. And at planning speed to 27, no 30, there was a 5% drag. So the idea was that these boats would rip into Cuban waters use up the fuel in the back one, let it go, use up the fuel in the next one, let it go, then they go shoot somebody. This is Minotaur, 5.5 meters. That was the most, what a gorgeous boat. For them. That was such a great boat. We had won the right to go to the Olympics in a different boat here in Marblehead in a very tight series with Ted Hood and company. And we brought the boat into the, but Minotaur kept, we watched Minotaur. It was not sailed very well, but she would beat us to the weather mark. So we finished the series and we said to ourselves, we have got to take that boat to the Olympics. So we get into the Boston Yacht Club. How do these things happen? The boat got T-boned by a power boat. It didn't destroy it. We actually sailed it the next day. And my father said, look, take the boat that you want in Take Minotaur, put just the mainsails up on each boat because they were almost identical. Go out, and we went right out here. It was blowing about 10. He said, I want you to go dead downwind. We went dead downwind and Minotaur would just outpace our boat dramatically. So we convinced the committee to take it to the Olympics and the rest is history. We won. We didn't even have to sail the last race. <laughs> This picture is <laughs> only because when we were awarded the gold medal, we took all three positions. <laughs> oh, yes. So George, Dave, and I, we took, we took all the front positions and the committee sitting there going, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is the venerable Boston Whaler. There are well over 100,000 of them built. Uh, my brother and I tested the original boat, which was solid glass, clear, so we could watch for cavitation. Uh, Dick Fitt, that boat, incredible. I bought my wife a 93, and she just loves it. We live on the Westport River. And this is the guy, Dick Fisher. He really was very instrumental in the 110s. And this is the picture that was in Life magazine in 1961. <laughs> of cutting the whaler in half, and you could still go boating in the bow of the stern. <laughs> but Dick Fisher, he, he really had a persistence about him that's just amazing. He, he really, did, he was an incredible human being. <laughs> <laughs> this
this is a, the third five and a half that my father designed in 1963. This is the 63 World Championship in Sawanaka. And talk about how things happen. We went into the Nationals and I sailed with the owner, UC Nemes. But UC just wasn't that good a sailor. And the last race, I don't know, I think we finished in the middle of the fleet or something. The last race, his yard burned down in Finland. <laughs> So he had to go home. So he said to Raymond, he said, well, Raymond, why, Ray, why don't you sail the boat? And my father had never raced a five and a half. He hadn't sailed the one design boat in 12 years. But he said, okay. So we went out. We didn't do very well. We got a, There were 45 boats, and it was the largest. That's when the five and a half meter was at its peak. And we, uh, we got an eighth in the first race. Then we got two firsts and two thirds. And under Olympic scoring back then, when you won, you got a hellacious number of points. We did not have to sail the last two races. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was such a great victory, Time Magazine ran a full page article. Wow. And then in his later years, Raymond, we had a place in New Hampshire with 40 acres of land, and um, he would be experimenting all the time. He made a maple syrup stove that you started with the sap at one end, and you ended up with syrup at the other. <laughs> <laughs> and we had syrup coming out of our ears. I mean, it's crazy. And he also went to the New Hampshire state and convinced them, this was during the first fuel crisis, he said, you know, you can grow poplars to maturity in about eight years as a renewable energy. And he was absolutely right. Wow. So up until the end, the man never stopped. He just was incredible. Museum Yawning did a thing for him in 1977. 26 hunts attended it. It was kind of cool. There's Raymond on the upper left. Easterner and Sea Blitz. Did 42 sailboat designs, 35 powerboat designs. 57 trophies. Guy just won. I never seen a sailor like him. When I got out of the Olympics, and we I figured, well, I must know something about sailing. We went into the world championship three years later in the five and a half meter. We're going up when and Raymond said, I think we're going to get a wind shift in about eight minutes. And I'm looking and looking. And I said to myself, well, I don't see the goddamn thing anywhere. We did. He was good. And the, the only point of putting this last part in here, and then I'll get out of here, is that the V-Hull has not changed since in over 50 years now. It's still a 24 degree dead rise. And John Decatel, who I think is up next. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is the development of the V Hull. That's the original hunt form in 40. That's Sea Blitz in 1950. And that's the V Hull in 1958. And the buttocks, the reason the V-Hull worked was that the buttock lines were absolutely straight. So all you had to do was put more horsepower on the boat. The other boats had rocker, and I never understood that. It seems to me like I fly airplanes, and it seems to me like a curved hull in the bottom actually creates a lift downward. And that's what happens to power boats. You drive them faster and faster, and they sink lower and lower and lower. And but the V-Hull didn't do that because it was a straight run. This is a picture of John Decatel only. Uh, he joined my father in the early 60s, and he still owns Hunt, Hunt um, Design. Very, they've done a marvelous job. They still have eight people designing power boats. Now, it's just a picture of their office in New Bedford. They used to be in Long Wall. And there's just some of the customers, and you can rip through these, James. These are just some of the boats they've done. That's my son in the upper left. He works for Hunt Yards. He's the chief engineer and head of manufacturing. Uh, just another vessel for Camper and Nicholson. 
Here's a little guy. That was a cool boat. This is something. They built 12 of these at Gladding and Hearns down in near Fall River in Somerset. They only had 2,800 horsepower, huge Hamilton jet drives. They burn 140 gallons an hour. <laughs> they do 40 knots, and being a jet drive, you strap yourself in, you can turn the wheel hard over, and the boat will go 180 degrees in practically its own length. It's just bizarre. They use these as sub chasers. I don't know where they chase themselves. <laughs> And uh, this last slide, I think it's the last slide, is they've been very successful with doing um, pilot boats because they're such good sea boats. And they have to go up alongside these ships in like the Columbia River, which are just notorious. I don't know if you've ever been through one of those things, but it's, I, we sailed my big cat through one and I almost had a heart attack. It was only going about eight knots, but they were 10 foot seas. So they've done a lot of that. Anyway, they carry the tradition on, and I give them a lot of credit. I think that might be the end. Oh, this is Stars and Stripes. Those are just some boats they did for the Navy, I guess. So, phew, I hope you survived all that. Wow. Thank you, Jim. You know, as I, as I said, you know, Raymond was, he was a complex person certainly had some issues, but he never stopped. Where he got the money, I'll never know. We never really had much money, but he would put everything into building boats and racing, and racing with him, it was interesting. When he, anytime he was at sea, he never touched alcohol. Now on land, I think he would have a keg on his back. <laughs> he had a real, he had an issue with alcohol, there's no question about it. But in sea, it never happened. And I think that's why that trip to the Bahamas and the one to England when we lived on Harrier as a family for four months was so memorable to me. And when I married my wife, we've now been married 36 years, I told her, I said, you know, at some point I'm going to go sailing. Well, 10 years later we did. Took a 40, a custom of day 40, and sailed it to Turkey and back. 30,000 miles, we had a wonderful time. And if, I say again, if you ever, ever have the opportunity to go and do some of these things with your children, it's, it's, it's priceless, it really is priceless. And we did not have a single incident the entire time, it was just great. I mean, it doesn't mean everything was hunky-dory, but uh, it was dory-hunky. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions, but I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> or maybe you're all booked out. When did the 225 come in? Pardon me? The 225. When did it come in? After the 110. And I don't know how many they built, but there was also another one, Huntress. Right. Which had a hull about like, I mean, with all due respect, if somebody owns it, you know, I apologize. <laughs> I think it's the worst boat he ever, the most, the worst looking boat he ever designed. I just couldn't believe it. But anyway, it's still around. It's down in Quisset, I think. But the, the, the boat that I really would love to have seen made was this one. I think that would just be the coolest thing in the world. 55 people. Can we do it sometime? Yeah. <laughs> with your money. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering uh, how much oversight he did on the actual building of it. I mean, after he designed it, how much did he oversight? Not much. How he much? had Fenwick Williams, which was another Marblehead person. One of the... Fenwick did, you know, in those days, there was no computer. Everything was done by hand. And when, you should see the drawing. My wife and I went up to see Fenwick um, a few years back, and he gave us some of the drawings. They're priceless. They're all done in ink. They're oh, absolutely magnificent. All the hull sections. And Fenwick, Fenwick did all the detail work. Raymond did all the... He actually did design the Boston Whaler in an envelope. I mean, you hear those stories all the time. Uh -huh. But we don't have the envelope to prove. <laughs> Before you, like, you, you overlaid your dad's... Um, uh, the shoulder? Yeah, the shoulder lines, it looks like, I mean, 
was there ever any discussion with your dad about that? Yeah. But I imagine it would be well, no, because a home farm, so. that was how many years later was it? Did I say it was thirty something years later? So at that point, I didn't know Raymond was alive. What's that was in this late sixties. Well, no, it was in. Well, I'd have to look at the book, but it was it was considerably later, and there was no. As far as I know, all I know is that my father and Ted Hood worked very closely together on a bunch of stuff. I mean, they raced together, and yeah. you know, and Ted Ted's an opportunist. He did a great job. So I don't discredit it. For it. It's just kind of amazing. That it would happen in the 30, you know, early 40s, and it would be transpired into the 70s, yeah. almost identical. Did any of your other siblings um, fall in love with sailing? Um, no, that's a good question. My younger brother did some, but he had a bad experience. <laughs> um, he actually sailed with me across the ocean, so that was good. The, the one thing I didn't touch on is that the whole family got seasick, except for Rain. And I mean seasick. <laughs> when I was racing out here, it was the last race, and there'd been a northeaster. Mm -hmm. we were, you know, here we are qualifying for the Olympics. <laughs> there was a big roller. And we were being towed out, and the boat's going like this. And I'm sitting down below with Dave Smith, turning pea green. <laughs> And we get to the, we finally started the race, we get to the weather mark, I'm taking the spinnaker like this and throwing up like this. <laughs> and these people, the fans, you know, going, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we had a real problem with seasickness. So I think, to answer your question, I don't know why I stayed with it, really. I get violently ill. My first commuter race, when I was 13 years old, I threw up for three days in a row, every hour. And then I got over it, but then it came back again. And the only thing it saved us, when we sailed Harrier from Cow's Week up to Godberg, Sweden, we crossed the North Sea, and Dramamine had just come out. So we all took Dramamine. Now, we were all as dizzy as kites. And <laughs> <laughs> but nobody got seasick, and it was the first time that we'd ever operated as a plane. My older sister has done some sailing. She actually... We brought the big catamaran down the west coast of, of uh, Mexico. Nina and I got typhoid fever really badly. We mm -hmm. had taken all the precautions and stuff. And Nina had to get off the boat. And my sister and brother-in-law came down and I hope they're not here. But they, you know, they think they're better sailors than they are. That's, that's kind of scary. <laughs> but anyway, we were on a big cat and I love that. It's just the problem with them is the expenses are just so big. I mean, you got to build them light, otherwise they're dangerous. So, to answer your question, no, very few of them. I think I was the only one stuck with it. I don't know how, how I did. I, I determined at a very young age that there were probably eight things I wanted to do in life, and by the age of 50, I'd done them all, and that was a mistake. <laughs> I peaked, I, I peaked too early. <laughs> Any other? Hey, what did your dad think of the 110? I mean, he's obviously fond of the whole box shape, all design, he pursued it, but was he was he proud of the oh, yeah, accomplishment? You know, the 110 became very popular. That was right down his alley. Yeah. You know, it was a different looking boat. Not that he necessarily had to go in that direction, but back then, you know, the 110 was, you look at it and you go, what the hell is that? I mean, it's nothing bad about it. It's just a different looking boat. No, he loved it. I think it's proven by the fact that he did the 225 and the 210. Yeah, yes, they weren't exactly the same. And he did this thing, which I think is just, I think that's just incredible. And if you know, we've been wondering, the 225 showed up this weekend, last weekend, it was a lot of fun. How many of those were built, you know? I don't know. I would guess. I really don't know. I would guess maybe a half a dozen, but I could be wrong. Graves, you know, Graves Yard Yard over here, they built hundreds of my father's boats. They built most of the shoulders, a lot of the V-hulls, 
one ten, two ten. I mean, I say hundreds. I think it's not an exaggeration. Salmon Graves was very. He and my father were quite close. Mm -hmm. So, I have a question. Yeah. What if about marine grade plywood and the existence of that material and the ability to design a hull with plywood. Was that an important factor in the concept? Of oh, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. So yeah, one of the problems with plywood is that you can't put it into compound curves very well. Okay. And so that's why the 110 in particular is quite flat, quite flat sided top and bottom all the way around, whereas this boat's got rocker in it. Uh -huh. A fortune. But that, no, that was it. And the two tens, you know, that's when they first came out with Harborite, which was a coated plywood. It had some kind of a, almost like a formica coating on it. And that went for a while, and after that, I don't know. Plywood was just, it was a cheap, easy, yeah, it's pretty simple to take a piece of plywood. So is the, is the 110 one of the first, or the first plywood-based design? Yeah. Can't answer that. Oh, I could be. That's why he did it. I mean, he he figured out that plywood was inexpensive. The process was inexpensive. The original 110 sold for I don't know four or five hundred dollars. Less. Less? Did you say less? No, I said wow. Oh. <laughs> so I I think he just and he was willing to experiment. I mean. If you look at the stuff that the guy did over the years, right. not counting his superb, he was one of the, as I say, he's one of the best sailors I've ever sailed with. I put him in the league of Buddy Melgis as a seat of the pants sailor. Buddy Melgis, when he was sailing the Soling going into the Olympics, never competed against another Soling. He would take his crew, Peter Barrett and company, and they would go out in Lake Michigan and raise. They'd just go out and sail. He goes to the Olympics and he won a gold medal. But the guy was an incredible seat of the pants sailor. My father was. I never was. I was not a technical sailor nor a, I was sort of the middle of the road, but I had the drive. And in my opinion, if you, if you have the drive and you're racing, you probably do pretty well. As long as you follow the key. You know, the key to racing, in my opinion, is the boat absolutely has to work. <laughs> yep. I saw four boats down here without masthead flies. Maybe that was a visual. I can't imagine sailing a boat without a masthead fly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the boat absolutely has to work. You have to have a compatible crew, and you have to have the will, and you got to watch your competition to see what they're good at and see what they're not good at and capitalize on it. I think if you get aggressive when we were when we went to the North American men's we won 14 straight races and I told my brother and friend I said I don't want you talking with the competition and not to be unfriendly but they're going to try and psych you out and they did but they didn't succeed so we just plowed through the series it took us a month to get there. I'm intrigued by that keel it, it's, it looks like a precursor to the wing keel well, no, actually, I'm sorry, there's a lead piece that went on the bottom. Actually, this would look just like a 110 or a 210 piece. Uh -oh. so there are little mounting holes here. Where it ended up, I don't know. There was a ball bottom. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. It was a lead ball. <clears throat> the reason they made it out of lead was that they would change the weight of it and the size of it. They could change it quickly. Two. I read in an article that Ray had built some boats that looked like a 110, but they were a couple of feet shorter before he did the 110. And then he went and That's, Yeah, I think there were like there were like three prototypes. So yeah. He and Dick Fisher. I think he and Dick Fisher collaborated and made different iterations of the boat, and they finally ended up with what they ended up. There's one. One of the early 110s had absolutely plumbed. There was no curve, oh, no curves in the end of the hull, just plumb. So yeah, there were, but there weren't a lot of change. It was a very simple boat to build in a very, I tell you, watching him go through the water, you know, I always thought that Minotaur, the 5.5 that we won the gold medal in, was one of the best sailing boats. It would go through the water 
and hardly disturb a ripple. And you just look at it and you go, God, that's just fantastic. You want your one tango through the water, at least blowing 10 or 15 or whatever. It's just a, it uses its whole water line. And water line is speed. Speed, speed. Long water line is speed. That's all it would be. That's why this boat would have been so fast. The water line would have been as long. Under sail, the water line would have been as long as the boat. And there's nothing that makes a sailboat go faster than the Nothing. Because every boat develops a parabolic wave. And if you can stretch that out, and it's only one, usually. If you can stretch that out, you can go faster. Do you think your father expected the 110? to evolve as it is into a plane, like, like you do now, in Greece? Yeah. yeah, I do. Although the trap obviously helps a lot. Right, that, that ties into it in the 60s. Yes, definitely. I mean, you look at the shape of the keel and the rudder, I mean, you know, those are pretty minimal surfaces. I mean, it's why I hate these full-bodied sailboats. I just think they're, mm -hmm. I think they're just absolutely ridiculous. The boat we sailed across the Atlantic, the O'Day 40 that I modified, I thought that was one of the neatest boats because it had a relatively short keel, separate rudder, weighed less than 20,000 pounds, and my wife and I could handle that boat almost anywhere. All right, good people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.